I'm Cynthia Rowland, and this is episode 55 of EO Radio Show. This is our sixth in a series of quick tip episodes focusing on the details of state registration of nonprofit corporations. In previous episodes, we talked about a number of states. If you want to go back and look at them, episode 38 was Delaware and California, which are the most frequently used by our clients, most of whom have a connection with California. Episode 40 focused on filings in Nevada and Arizona. 43 looked at Washington State and Oregon. 47 addressed Alaska and Hawaii. And most recently, episode 52 looked at New York and New Jersey. With the help of Joe Hilliard, today we look at the basic state filing requirements for nonprofit corporations operating in Massachusetts and Connecticut. We'll work our way through the rest of the states in future episodes. Welcome to the EO Radio Show, your nonprofit legal resource. Brought to you by the Exempt Organizations Group at Ferella Braun and Martell. My name is Cynthia Rowland, and I'm a partner at Ferella. I'm a business and tax lawyer with more than 30 years of experience advising clients on nonprofit and charity law. Through this podcast, our lawyers and guests will discuss a range of legal and business issues impacting the nonprofit world because we understand you work hard every day to make your community a better place to live and do business. Many of our programs focus on the basics and at times we'll do a deep dive into narrow and complicated legal issues. Again, welcome to the EO Radio Show. We're glad you're here. As we discussed in previous episodes, nonprofit corporations are one variety of fictitious business entities. Others include partnerships and limited liability companies. The laws of all the states prescribe certain formalities that organizers of these business entities must go through so that the entity can be regulated and subject to legal process as a person. Since business enterprises aren't natural persons, the laws have developed mechanisms for treating them like natural persons. This is where the state filings come into play. In order for the organizers of these fictitious entities to take advantage of the protection of the laws, they have to provide notice as to the legal name, the state whose jurisdiction they are claiming for corporate organization laws, a physical address where they can be served with legal process, and certain other information. In this episode, we aren't going to dive deep into the pros and cons for where to incorporate, but instead we are focusing on the ease of formation, standardized documents that are available, filing fees, and similar matters. As with all the states we have discussed, if you do business as a nonprofit in Connecticut or Massachusetts or solicit charitable contributions there, even if just through your website, the nonprofit may need to have a legal presence and be registered in those two states. So for the details on Massachusetts and Connecticut, we welcome back Joe Hilliard. Joe is a senior paralegal at Ferrella, and he specializes in formation and compliance matters for all manner of entities, and in particular, charities that are tax-exempt under Internal Revenue Code Section 501c3. Prior to joining us at Ferrella, he worked in-house for several real estate development and management companies in Southern California, and he's worked extensively on real estate purchase transactions and vendor contracting. Welcome back to the show, Joe. Hi, it's good to be here again. So let's start with Massachusetts. What documents are needed for a new corporation to form itself in Massachusetts, and what does a foreign corporation do to register there? For sure. So in Massachusetts, it fits in one of the older states. It's actually the Secretary of the Commonwealth, not the Secretary of the State, as Massachusetts is a Commonwealth. Okay, that good to know. It is a com. Okay. (laughs) Remembering our social studies from from high school there when we talked about those things. The domestic, they do have a form articles of organization that covers all domestic corporations, profit and nonprofit. It's a three page form. It's basically a blank space fill in for almost all of the articles. As we discussed with New York last time, this one also has an Article 2 section for specific purpose of the corporation where we can fill out that it's the nonprofit. And then Article 4, while it does not have specific call-out language for the nonprofit IRS that's required for specific provisions, it does say I have a note for, quote, other lawful provisions, if any, for conduct and regulation of the business and affairs of the corporation, unquote, which will fit this requirement nicely where you can put that in the 501c language. And here, we, as we've talked about for a lot of these, all the original officers and directors must be named. Then similarly, for a foreign nonprofit, the state just has one foreign corporation certificate of registration form that's used, again, for both profit and nonprofit corporations. Similarly, it's a three-page form, asks basic items, state of incorporation, the financial year-ending month and date for your corporation, which will be an issue we talk about as we go through here for our annual reports, and then all of its officers and directors need to be named. 
Okay. So is Massachusetts an expensive state for um, filing your domestic articles or your nonprofit, your foreign registration? So for your domestic, the answer will be no. It's just a filing straight fee of $35 for domestic. However, for a foreign, it's $400 for the foreign certificate of registration and $375 if you file by fax. Unlike other states we've discussed prior, and we haven't really talked about this just because we talk about the nonprofit costs, but most states give you a, a breakdown for nonprofits. For instance, in California, we've talked, it was, it's $70 to, to register a profit corporation, but it's only $35 for a nonprofit. Similarly here, with the domestic corporation, it would be $200, but it's only $35 here in Massachusetts. But here, there's no declination between a nonprofit and a for-profit pay scale when it comes to a foreign entity. A foreign corporation is a foreign corporation. I actually emailed the state to confirm this, and their response for a nonprofit was, it's, quote, strictly foreign, same documents as foreign business, same fees across the board for all types of filings. So... It's $400 to register with the state for your nonprofit corporation. It's like, it's, that's a very interesting take on what this is. Usually you give your nonprofits a break state to state, but we're not seeing that here. That's pretty expensive, $400 to register in foreign nonprofit in Massachusetts. But if you have to do it, you have to do it. That depends on whether you're soliciting or doing business there. That's interesting. That's pricey. So what's the response time for these filings? Per the Massachusetts FAC on their website, fax filing should be the same day if submitted during business hours, but could take up to 48 hours. They don't have any similar notes on their timing for their online filings, but third-party research indicates it's about the similar time frame. In theory, it should be that same business day if you do it during business hours, but up to 48 hours. The Secretary of the Commonwealth does have an expedite available for fax and e-filings, which is based on the cost of your order. It goes up on percentage. So the 35 domestic would be a $6 expedite, but the $400 foreign would give you a $15 expedite. There's a link to this chart with their expedite, along with all of our other stuff in the show notes when we talk about the Massachusetts items. So feel free to look at that. <laughs> okay. A lot of this stuff will be linked in the show notes so that we try to fill in a whole lot of Links so that you can reach the specific information you need. I'm always curious about in these various states is the transparency concerns. What sort of information has to be included about the individuals involved in when filing in Massachusetts? So in Massachusetts, this is going to be the first one where we see a, a much bigger level of what they're requiring. Here, the initial officers and the board members will need to be identified, which we discussed on the form, but they will also need to provide both a residential and a corporate address for them. Similarly, in the foreign certificate, only the business address needs to be provided for the office and board members. But here we're starting to see where they're asking for some much more personal information. And yes, this is something that comes up will be shown then on their website. These forms will be will be uploaded in their in their entirety. So and similarly with this, before we even go further talking about that, the signatory for the domestic articles needs to provide an address and so, when when they're signing, which is unusual. We've not seen before. Usually just the officer signs and that's it. But here here it can be the business or residential address. But again, they're asking for a much more physical presence and idea of this that's to be transparent with who's there in the state. Interesting. So if a listener has concerns about that and wants to incorporate in Massachusetts, you may want to check with advisors or counsel to see if there's a workaround or if there's a concern about transparency. Sometimes there's not because a lot of the information becomes public on the 990 and the charity registrations, but not always. So if that's a concern, check into that further. So, so let's shift to annual filings. This is often the bigger part of the decision making. If the annual filings are onerous, that can add a lot of burden to particular state registration. So what do you have to do annually in Massachusetts? In Massachusetts, annual reports for nonprofits are due November 1st of each year, irrespective of when the nonprofit was formed or registered. Note that as well as in updating all the offices and directors to include a expiration of their term. It also asks for the date of the last annual meeting of the board. Yeah. Both of these are items. Yes, both of these are definitely not items we've seen in annual reports prior. It seems very unusual, but again, keeping to an idea that they really are strict, that you're mining all your P's and Q's in the, in the background as well. Interesting. Yeah, that would be a challenge for a lot of the clients I work with to, um, I mean, not so much updating the officers and directors, but stating an annual meeting date you know, some do, some don't. Okay. So annual fees, is there a filing fee for each year? Yes. Yeah, so for the domestic, it's going to be $15 a year. 
And then for the foreign nonprofits, as we've discussed, it's tied to just their regular foreign. It would be 125 annually there for that and $100 if you file it electronically. Specifically for the foreign nonprofits, they put it, they have a timely on it where it will move up to 150 if you're late. There doesn't seem to be anything similar for state domestic ones, but for, for foreign corporations registering untimely, they, they, they put a fee on you automatically. So it always pays to, as we say, keep a calendar, keep track at least a month in advance, start really thinking about that and go, Hey, let's, let's get this into the state. So there's no issues. All right. Um, so any other state agencies supervising nonprofits in Massachusetts? Curious, what's the lay of the land there? As we've discussed with a lot of the other states, um, Massachusetts, that all the organizations that have charitable assets or engage in charitable activities there in the state or solicit charitable contributions are required to register with the nonprofit organizations public charities division with the state attorney general's office, um, which is common. We've seen that most, most states use their attorney general for those. And then Additionally, if you're obtaining state tax exemptions in Massachusetts, uh, the nonprofit will need to apply with the Massachusetts Department of Revenue. And again, we've got links to both of those, their front pages in the show notes, so you can see what you need to do for both of those. All right. So Massachusetts is a bit of an outlier in terms of details that they want and expense for the foreign nonprofit. So let's turn our gaze now to Connecticut. How does Connecticut's in that same general region? It's also an original state, I believe, going back again to uh, maybe that'll be our theme. We'll, we'll knock off the rest of the initial 13 states. We've got a few of them, but yeah, let's do that. So anyway, Connecticut, Connecticut, what do we need to do to file in Connecticut? So unlike Massachusetts, Connecticut is a state. So we're going to deal with their secretary of state here. We're back to what us on the West Coast think of as more normal nomenclature <laughs> there. <laughs> they too have a form certificate of incorporation, domestic non-stock corporation. So they, they, they refer to us all as non-stocks here. As non, the nonprofit is a non-stock in terms of their state law. And on that form, it has a space which is called the nature of activities to be conducted. And that's where the 501c3 call out will be in there. And then they have an other provision section, which can be used to further IRS language. It also needs to include a required nonprofit statement, which notes the corporation is nonprofit and shall not have or issue shares of stock or make distributions, unquote. It's again, it's something that has to be sort of marked in the form or we'll talk about here, put into whatever you file. Going back to a discussion we had a few episodes, again, the NAICS code should be included here again. And again, for a quick brief, that's the North American industry classification system the feds use for statistics and just gives an idea of what kind of a nonprofit you are. So we and again, we've probably done that with you in terms of getting your 1023 together and having an idea of what you're doing. But it's something that should be in your mind and be part of the filing here in Connecticut. But that's just for the domestic Connecticut nonprofit corporation. No, no, actually, the foreign will have to do that, too, as we get down here. So know your NAICS code. <laughs> yes, know your NAICS code. So I noted, too, as I went through some of the system here, much like California, a lot of the, the domestic Connecticut generated their own document rather than use the form to make sure they got all of their items covered. So this is something to think about. And we talked about using the forms because we've seen a lot of robust ones lately. But much like the California, this doesn't quite have the language where we I'm looking and seeing domestic Connecticut's using their own, you know, typing it out into a couple of paragraphs to make sure they cover everything and feel real comfortable with their 501c3 cutouts. So I think that's something to think about here. Think about with your counsel before you just go ahead and fill out the form. And with this too, as we'll talk about this here with, with the domestic, it's not quite the annual reports, but like California, you have to file an organization and first report within 90 days of the formation. So it's essentially the same as an annual report, but you have to do it within three months of doing that. So we would recommend filing this as close to the formation, if not, you know, that same day, if you have all the information, because it, this one will reaffirm the NAICS code. And it, this is where you will name the officers and the board members. Any addresses required there for the officers and directors? We talked about this with Massachusetts where they wanted residences, but... Yes. Yeah, so here in Connecticut, in both the foreign application itself and in the organization and first report that you will file for the domestic immediately thereafter, the initial officers and board members will need to be identified and they, again, will need to provide both a residential and a business address here. And this one, even more specific, said that PO boxes are not acceptable for either of these addresses either because... In, obviously, here in California, a lot of times for business, we have business mailing addresses where we put a P.O. box. But here, they very specifically said P.O. boxes are not acceptable for these two. 
All right. Well, that's a pretty high degree of transparency. I think I skipped over foreign nonprofit applications. So there they it's just a it's a simple form. It's an application for certificate of authority. It's like a three page one. It notes the the NAICS code and names the officers and the directors. And again, we just talked about that, including their business and home addresses. But other than that, it's just a, a top level. This is the address. This is where we're registered. You know, we're a Delaware corporation. We're a California corporation and we're registering here. And it's relatively simple. But again, it does have these transparency concerns. So. All right. So um, how pricey is Connecticut? The filing fee for the domestic Connecticut non-stock is $50. And oddly, the fee is only $40 for a foreign non-stock. It's actually cheaper to be to be a foreign hmm. nonprofit in Connecticut than to that fee for the organization and first report is an additional $50. And we've we kind of lost over, but as always, remember to include any service fees that your agent that you've chosen in those states may attack and yeah. use with this as well. If they're fi- helping you assist with the filing and then too, as the agent, how much they're charging you annually. Remember those costs as you do this as well. Yeah, good advice. What's the turnaround look like for these startup filings? Connecticut, their website also did not have a current processing time chart on it, but looking at third-party online entities, they note that it's about three to five business days to get your filings, and they do have a 24-hour expedite available for $50, which is an unreasonable. Not too bad. So let's talk a little bit about the annual filings, first for the domestic and then for the foreign. Or is it the same for both of them? It's the same for both of them. The annual report is due the last business day of the corporation's anniversary month. So it's more similar to like what we see here in California. If we form today, September 18th, then the first annual report will be due by September 30th, 2024. Okay. And so the annual report for the foreign is uh, still based on the corporation's anniversary month, its formation. Both the foreign and domestic are based on your formation date. Again, that's very similar to what we see here in California. Okay. That makes sense. And the annual reports, is there a fee? There's a fee for that as well, right? There's a fee for for both domestic and foreign. It's $50 and it's mandatory to be filed online. They don't have a a paper version of it. Fine. (laughs) The more they... I was going to say that's... We we haven't really discussed that, but that seems fairly common for for most states. I'd say like the big exception I think we've seen was really Hawaii, where they give you an option to file it by paper. But most of them have gone to, especially again, because it's mostly a checkbox this is where I'm at. This is confirming, confirming, click. No, I'm revising and add an address. I, that they've, The states have really tried to streamline the annual reports as much as possible. And again, it's not unlike, say, our formations where we're, we're dealing with like adding our 501c3 language and having a lot of specifics to what type of nonprofit you are. It, this is, again, a checkbox. Yes, I'm still here. Yes, I'm still in business. Yes, these are still my officers. So it's kind of easy for the states to do that as an online only. And there's a lot of stuff. I think a, a two post-COVID, we've seen a lot of states that used to have the option of either or really just switched over when their offices were closed to keep that and have found it to be much more convenient to, to do that. <laughs> yeah, for everybody, I think. So um, what are the supervisory state agencies in Connecticut? If your nonprofit's domiciled there in Connecticut or the same thing, if we solicit to the from in the state, you need to register with the Connecticut Department of Consumer Protection Charities Unit. Um, they have a ve- actually have a very informative nonprofit overview on their uh, website that's very specific to the state and what you need to do, what kind of documentation they have. That's in the show notes. It's, re- it's actually really great to see what you need to do in Connecticut. Um, and then they have- if you're doing uh, tax exemptions, it's their Department of Revenue there in the in the state. So again, all of these are linked in the show notes. All right. So this has been great. Very informative as usual, Joe. Thanks for taking the time to track all this down and put it in an organized fashion. Uh, it was great having you again. Thanks. I'm glad I could come by again. Yeah, this is terrific. So next time we'll continue on our um, original states theme. So that's all for this episode. Be sure to check out the show notes for links to all the resources we mentioned and links to earlier episodes on the states we've already covered. Also, Pharrella Braun and Martel now has a YouTube channel and there are several nonprofit playlists that are just the the, uh, podcast recordings. So it's really nice to have them included in one place where we're building out playlists. So anyway, take a look there if you're a YouTube regular. Look for those links in the show notes as well. I'm Cynthia Rowland, and you've been listening to EO Radio Show, your nonprofit legal resource, brought to you by the Exempt Organizations Group at Pharrella, Braun & Martell. If you have suggestions for topics you would like for us to discuss, please email us at eoradioshow at fbm.com. That's eoradioshow at fbm.com. Thank you for joining us, and until next time, make a difference. (music) 